Okay, I'm Nigel Mortimer. I'm the Estuaries Officer with South Devon uh, Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty Estuaries Partnership. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful and so is my email address. <laughs> I'm going to be talking today about uh, mostly about the estuaries that we manage with the local community. Um, you know, it's always very tempting to say I look after the estuaries, but really my post is trying to work with the local community to encourage and facilitate them to look after our wonderful estuaries and coast. I'm probably going to be talking quite a bit about some stuff that you know, hopefully plenty of stuff that you don't. It's very informal. Um, so it probably easier with being online to keep questions to the end. But if you've got anything really burning, um, please shout out. I'm not going to keep uh, monitoring the uh, the what do you call it the meeting chat because it's just one screen too many for me. So with that, I'll make a start. On this screen, you can see the the different organisations that uh, help pay into our local partnership. As said, I now work for the South Devon Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty within a small team of, uh, what is it, one, two, three, four, six of us, how do you count there? Okay, uh, I first started off in the Salcombe Harbour office, um, as Paula said, only really uh, involved in the Salcombe Kingsbridge estuary, and I have to admit, if there's nobody here from locally, that's probably still the, the estuary that's dearest to my heart. Of course, the AOMB is more of a landscape designation. It has fixed boundaries. But as anybody that knows that if you're working within estuaries, the, the best, the, the boundaries are, are very, very fuzzy indeed. So we, uh, the AOMB management is a statutory thing. And we have a management plan for that. Um, but the South Devon AOMB is very much around the five South Devon AOMB estuaries. I have to keep saying AOMB because the, the teen is sort of South Devon as well. And I'll be in huge trouble if I suggested that's one of ours as well. Within the uh, management plan, the, the estuaries and coast uh, is very important. If you look at the map of the AOMB, you'll see that it takes in all five of the estuaries, but really normally just up to the, the tidal limit. Although very oddly, the Dart estuary doesn't even take in that. It only does, just goes up to Totnes. It's one of those quirks of history. And then within the uh, AMB management plan, we have the estuaries management plan. Initially, we had five individual estuary management plans because what we try and do with these is to, even though that many of the issues are very generic and you know many of the solutions are as generic, what we try and do is to get the local communities within, around a particular estuary to take ownership and pride in that so that they feel in, involved in it. Probably the best thing to do is to start off asking ourselves the question of what is an estuary? And as I'm sure many of you will know, it's really the area, the zone, the place where the fresh water uh, from normally from a river mixes with the salt water of the sea. Yeah, that, that's the easy bit. But of course, because of the tides, particularly in North Devon with your huge tidal range, where those two waters mix, it you know moves up and down what we call the estuary. So the estuary is more of a zone, if you like, than necessarily an area. Now we say mixing, but that isn't always true uh, because salt water with the salt in it is more dense than fresh water particularly in calm conditions, sometimes the, the fresh water will float out over the salt water. And as a tide comes in, very often you'll get this salt wedge that creeps up underneath the estuary. So, um, 
So, I mean, obviously, most people realise the importance of estuaries for, for bird life, which we see flow, um, flying in, but they're equally, if not more important for fish life, and they will, some of those will migrate up and down the estuary, but they'll do it along the bottom of the estuary where it's most salty. As we'll discover later on, most creatures that live within the estuary are, tend to be more marine than they are freshwater. Now that, that flotation of the, the freshwater of the saltwater has a great deal of bearing on the ecology of our estuaries. And you get a migration with the tides of the, the bird life, of course, as we just mentioned. Some birds will migrate to the mudflats to feed when the tide is out. Other fish eating birds will migrate in with the tide coming in and you can see them sort of following the salt wedge coming up. Some wildlife will also migrate up and down within the estuary. So things like shore crabs, worms and clams and things. When the tide goes out, they'll hunker down in, into the mud. The, the mud tends to hang on to the salt. So for them, that's where the, you know, they, they can enjoy their more salty habitat. Something else that uh, happens with estuaries, and this is one of the reasons why estuaries tend to be such muddy places, is that the salt within the, the water, uh, is a, I'm not quite sure if it's a chemical reaction or a, a physical reaction, but the salt within the water, uh, it's, a, it's an ionic solution. So the ions, the, the, the sodium and the chlorine, somebody else can probably explain this better, but they in my mind, they act a little bit like tiny little magnets, but maybe some people suggest that's misleading, but you know, we can all understand magnets a bit better. So those little, that, that, that ionic solution encourages tiny particles that are carried within the water to clump together, making them bigger and heavier. So they then settle out much more quickly. So you've got a, a double whammy happening within estuaries. So you've got the energy of streams and rivers bringing all the silt and debris down. And then as they open, the, enter the big wide open areas of the estuary, they, it, they tend to settle. Then you get this ionic process taking place, this called flocculation. There's no test after this, by the way. This, this process is called <laughs> flocculation, and that tends to clump together the finer materials and they settle out too. So that's part of the reason why estuaries are such very, very muddy places. Now, the, the test tubes there, the test tube on the left <clears throat> has got salt in it. The test tube on the right has got just fresh water in it. And I, you, know, you can demonstrate this in classrooms. If you're doing it in a classroom and you want it to happen quicker, you use you tend to use um, was it potassium chloride as a salt because it makes it all happen that much faster. So muddy places. Now we tend to think of estuary mud as you know more bits of actual mud, bits of silt, bits of um, sediment, but also tied up within that, there's a huge amount of organic debris. And some of that debris comes down from the, the streams, from the, the, from the catchment um, carried by the rivers. But a proportion of that also comes in from the sea. So, you know, we're thinking about here is all the plankton that comes in with every tide and debris from seaweeds and dead marine life and the like. And then from the catchment, of course, you've got all the freshwater species um, that um, let, let go and get uh, washed down and the vast majority of those will actually die when they meet the, the, the salt water. Most fresh water, water organisms are very intolerant of salt uh, but there tend to be some more marine creatures that are more tolerant of fresh water as we'll discover later. And then of course in the autumn we get a huge amount of uh, leaf litter washing down as well. <clears throat> so within the estuarine conditions, you've got a huge amount of organic material that collect out over the mudflats together with the, the, the sediment that gets washed down as well. Now that all that organic material is food for other things. 
and in just uh, something like what well, we used to say six teaspoons of estuary mud you have as many bacteria breaking all that organic debris down as there are people on the planet but with population rise maybe we should start saying five teaspoons or something I'm not quite sure but there are so many bacteria in the surface of the mud that just about one centimeter down into the mud there is no oxygen left there are so many bacteria they've used up all the oxygen in the surface layers and if you've ever been treading around the mud of an estuary you'll realize how black and how smelly it is down there because the bacteria that still live down there they don't use the the normal oxygen carbon dioxide cycle they're into other chemicals and that goes way beyond my understanding but you know you get smells as hydrogen sulfide and and other things down there and that's the reason why the, the mud down there is so black so there is life down there but not as much as there is at the surface now of course those bacteria are food for other things and if you look carefully on the slide that what looks green on that slide but in real life is much more of a, a golden brown color that's the buildup of an organism called diatoms excuse me a moment <clears throat> so these are tiny little seaweeds and the extraordinary thing about these tiny little seaweeds is that they can actually move not a long way but they can migrate up and down in the surface of the mud with the tides obviously being seaweeds they're photosynthetic and they take the nutrients that are released by the bacteria into the mud they use the energy of the, the sun and of the quartz the water around them to photosynthesize and they produce uh, a, a sort of an, an oil <clears throat> and it's that oil that they ooze out and helps them slide across or through the mud and they tend to be most active when the tide is out and during the daytime and the understanding is that during the night or when the tide comes in these same diatoms will migrate down into the, below the mud presumably to stop them being predated by uh, other animals so this is a, a single diatom taken with an electron microscope and you can you see <clears throat> they are absolutely beautiful close up these are the typical estuary diatoms there are many many different species of diatoms out there in the plankton but this is the the general shape and look of an estuarine uh, diatom so those diatoms of course are the food for other things and as you look over the, the surface of the mud, you may find up to about 10,000 tiny little pinhead sized hydrobius snails that graze on these tiny diatoms. And so the whole food web uh, goes. Things like shell duck, if you see them out on the mud flats, they scythe their way through the, the surface of the mud, feeding uh, on those hydrobius snails mostly, apparently. And one of the things I love to do, if you find yourself a pontoon at the right time of tide, just as the tide is starting to come into the pontoon and make it float, look down into the mud and you'll see all the, the mud really coming to life. This is the, 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 what, the end of a siphon of an animal called a telin. And if I'm the, not a, a great picture, sorry. It's, it's a bivalve uh, animal that lives maybe um, 20 centimeters below the surface of the mud. And they have two siphons that come up to the surface in the mud and they suck the, the water down, filter it for their food. And then the wastewater comes out of the other tube. And the, the siphons are so thin, you can actually see the mud going down. Because when the water first comes in, they use the inhalant siphon, a bit like a vacuum cleaner, sucking up from the mud for the food. And you, you actually see it coming down. And every so often you see the waste come out of the other one. Apparently flatfish that like to feed on these, they'll come up with the tide and they'll graze on the end of these siphons. So they have to replace them quite, quite frequently, I believe. 
Of course, uh, as we discussed before, most people will know estuaries as incredible places for bird life, all with their different beaks and bills and their different behaviours for feeding on different animals on in the mudflats or fish within the water. As a marine biologist, I tend to get more excited about the, the colour and indeed the variety of fish that enjoy our estuaries too. Uh, not, every, uh, not every estuary will support seahorses by any means, um, but there are a lot of fish down there. It's just that we don't tend to see them because they're hidden by the water. Now, as I'm sure we'll, we all know, every estuary is particular is completely unique it comes down to its form the the size of the tides you know the geography how it was formed um, the variety of habitats and the like but they're all obviously unique they're all very special now in the uk uh, we have nine different forms of estuary but nearly all of them in the southwest are what we call these rear type estuaries and these are drowned river valleys. The, the one estuary that I know of that isn't a rear is the X estuary, and I believe that's a bar built estuary, but pretty much every other estuary in the southwest is what we call this rear estuary. And if you'll see the, the, the picture of it later, um, but the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary is an example of sort, something called a dendritic rear, and that just means that it's a, a fingered rear. So each creek of the estuary, if you like, is a rear in its own right. Now, rears formed sort of during and after the last ice age, uh, as the, the energy of the rivers of the melting ice carved their way through the land to create river valleys. And then sort of towards the end of the uh, ice age with all the melted water, sea levels rose by something like 120 meters from where they were during the, the, the maximum ice age. And they drowned some of the river valleys that have been created by the energy of the rivers. So that's how we have our rears. And they um, tend to be quite deep, narrow and steep sided. And as we know in the southwest, uh, many of them make terrific ports and harbours. So within the, the Salkin, sorry, within the South Devon A and B area, certainly all of our estuaries are these rear types. Uh, they range from a very the very typical estuaries of the Avon estuary, and then we have the two other extremes. The Kingsbridge estuary, which is very salt water dominated, and the Dart estuary, which is incredibly fresh water dominated. Dart uh, has a very large fresh freshwater catchment that starts up on Dartmoor. And indeed, after a, a rainstorm within the catchment, you can have pure fresh water pretty much floating over salt water right at the mouth of the, the Dart estuary uh, around Dartmouth. The Salk and Kingsbridge estuary has a very tiny catchment. There's some thought that, you know, the, the rivers that carved out the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary have been trapped by the likes of the Avon estuary next door. Sorry, we, we've got a new puppy and we're still trying to uh, toilet train her. So there's a <laughs> noise in the background. So the, the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary is very, very salt water dominated. And in many ways, it's much more of a, a mer tidal marine inlet. Uh, there are no rivers that flow into the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary. The biggest stream comes into Bochum Creek here, and it's by no means a, a large stream. If you were to kayak up there, you'd get about 10 meters and then have to stop. The other, so, you know, all of these things greatly affect uh, the, the life within our estuaries. So the, you've got the, the continual range of salinity that changes uh, with every tide. Now, the other big thing that changes, of course, are the tides themselves. So an animal that maybe lives 
here on the mud flat, uh, covered by water at high tide, and then you know fighting fresh water if there's a rainstorm with the tide out, or baking them in the summer the, at the height of the summer. So all of these things, these ever-changing conditions, actually make life within es our estuaries an incredibly difficult place to live. So rather oddly, our estuaries support a very low diverse, a, a particularly low diversity of life. But those animals and plants that can thrive within estuaries are here in huge, huge numbers. And so th this is a, a sort of diagram sort of suggesting the diversity within our estuaries. So we got great diversity within our freshwater systems and our marine systems. But within our freshwater systems, you'll see that the general diversity is that much lower. There are generally very few freshwater species that can tolerate this changing salinity. Uh, typical examples are things like um, the, the trout and salmon. Uh, there are very, very few species that are truly estuarine. The vast majority of them are freshwater tolerant marine species. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Our big habitats are our salt <laughs> marshes around the edges, our um, mud flats, of course, in some places, tidal reed beds, and in some estuaries, uh, also uh, so, um, sea grasses. And we have the common sea grass and the, the lesser known dwarf sea grasses. But within that, we mustn't forget the, the water of the estuary, which is a, a habitat in its own right. Now, all of these habitats are particularly important and in the news at the moment for the amount of carbon, if you like, blue carbon that they store and they are able to store it for a, a very long time. And some of those habitats, you know, I'm thinking of the salt marsh and the seagrasses here, uh, have an incredible assimilation of that carbon and are able to lock it up for, for a very long time. We're also uh, gradually realizing the importance of things like kelp beds, but with kelp beds, the carbon is probably being stored offshore in the, in the ocean ooze rather than below the, the kelp bed itself. So in sort of true Monty Python uh, style, what have estuaries ever done for us? Well, they're very important for the amount of carbon they, they take up. And reverse of that, the amount of oxygen they give us. I mean, all, I, you know, as we all know, the oceans as a whole give us something like 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. They're important uh, for the, as nursery grounds, as egg laying grounds for many, many commercially important fish. Don't test me on that. I don't know all the names of them. They are nature's great waste disposal unit. You know, for our catchments, they are the area that sort of capture and break down a huge amount of organic debris that comes down from the catchments. Arguably, we're overdoing that now. We will come across that later. And they are one of our great playgrounds. And in, we're also realizing, you know, as part of the sea as well, they are a great place for, particularly now within the, the COVID um, epidemic, epidemic, whatever it is, <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, how important these places are for our own well-being. Not necessarily sort of being there, but just knowing that they're there, you know, how many of us sort of are able to recharge by going to these places seeing the, the wildlife and just sort of recharging our own batteries using them. And for many of us, they are our playgrounds. One of the things I, I love to do is to perversely visit our estuaries at low tide because I just love watching the, the fish and other animals come in. I love seeing all, all the mud flats there. So let's have a look at the AOMB estuaries that we have. They range that they are now all um, designated in one form or another. 
we have the Yelm Estuary, the Erm, Avon, Salk and Kingsbridge and the Dart. The Yelm Estuary uh, nearest Plymouth, it's well within the commuter, commuter belt, uh, it's quite well populated, populated around the estuary and there are some places where you personally I feel a little bit hemmed in by all the properties around it but if you go up the, 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 the main creek you can find the, certainly find the wilds up there. It's a special area conservation, parts of it are triple SI and it's a bit more salt water dominated by most. Then have the uh, the Erm Estuary. It's often described as our least um, impacted. It's our most natural estuary, if you like. It's all within the ownership of one private estate. And what's wonderful about it, if you go there by uh, paddle power, because we have a right of navigation over the waters, you can see how estuaries, how they must have once looked. You know, you've got tree, a tree line right around the edge of the estuary there. The Avon estuary, which is probably a, a most typical estuary. It's both more recently been designated as a marine conservation zone. Uh, very pretty, but being a typical estuary with this low diversity, it's got less to write home about in terms of special wildlife. Then got the, the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary, this uh, tidal marine inlet. And because it's so saltwater dominated, it's got very many uh, marine habitats. And some of those are particularly sheltered from, from wave action and we have some um, habitats within the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary that are reckoned to be completely unique within the UK and supporting some very special um, habitat, sorry, very special wildlife communities. And then our biggest estuary, the Dart estuary to the east, and this, this one is big enough and deep enough for, for some seriously quite large boats to come into. We're very lucky uh, within our estuaries. We don't have any big industry. We have no one big uh, impact on our estuaries. If you like, our, our big industry around our estuaries is farming, um, you know, with, with the, the runoff from the, the, the farmland around. And on the whole, I would say that our big issues are the cumulative impact of very many small ones. And this is something, it, it's very difficult when people ask, you know, what can we do to look at our, est our estuaries? Everybody's looking for one, a nice big one-term fix, but actually what we need is a greater realization that it's all the little things that add up to be bigger problems for our estuaries. And so that's the reason why we try very hard to engage the, the whole of the local community in looking after them. Because we, we really don't want people getting the idea that it's only the farmers that are having an impact on our estuaries, it's us too. But it's important to add at this point that with climate change, we are seeing greater rainfall, particularly in shorter time periods. So we are getting greater and greater amounts of this kind of runoff, this soil erosion, not just from farms, but our own gardens too. And when we think about it, how much of our catchments are covered by our own back gardens. And on the whole, you know, we as private um, garden gardeners will probably use more fertilizer per square inch because we can afford to than a farmer would ever dream of doing. And of course, it's not just soil issues, but it's all the other pollutants that we put into our, our waters from our catchments. On the whole, you know, when we consider the water quality of our estuaries, the problems tend to come more from the water catchment area with a, a one-way flow downstream than comes in from the sea. Occasionally, of course, we'll get big issues like a, a, 
an oil disaster, but it's the even they pale in, into insignificance compared to the cumulative impact of the continual drip drip of pollutants from the catchments. So, you know, it's even thing we were talking earlier about all these organic um, debris coming into estuaries, breaking down by the bacteria. Even that, though, can be overloaded. And it's important that, you know, things like our garden waste, uh, so that we don't overload these already very nutrient rich um, ecosystems with ever more nutrients. So in this photograph, you've got uh, garden cuttings just being dumped over the, the garden wall with this belief that, you know, the the seas are big enough to continually take it and take it and take it. But as we're seeing with plastic pollution, we can overload the system. We're very often asked about what's the water quality like within our estuaries, but there are so many different parameters that we can measure water quality by. We all need water quality for very many different things. And it's from the nutrient levels to the pollutant levels, the, the clarity of the water, you know, it's hugely important to all of us. Now, many, one of the, <clears throat> sorry, one of the bigger problems that I tend to feel is that, you know, we don't tend to see many of the issues that are affecting our estuaries. It's, it's hidden by the waters and we just, don't realize it's there. I mean, I, I as a diver am sometimes surprised myself. You, you forget how, I was going to say not flat, sorry, bad English there, but how undulating uh, the, the topography of the one underwater sea really is. So it's, it's, it's not, it's the underwater topography that we forget about. It's the underwater beauty it's the, the very richness of the underwater life, how important it is to our life above the water. And on the whole, we, um, if the sea could uh, survive without us better than we could survive without the sea. And of course, very much also hidden is just how much pollution is entering the, the, the sea, how much we put into it. It goes under the water and we forget about it. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> Another issue is, you know, it's we, we tend to love things like the, the seahorses, the, 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 the colour of Devonshire cup coral and these kind of things. But there are many important organisms um, that we just tend to overlook. This is a, a nationally rare tentacled lagoon worm but it's slimy it's five millimeters long and it's just you know there there's a lot more that we need to discover about this worm to sell it to the general public to get the public excited about it so there's a, a lot awful, awful lot more work to do another thing that we have a problem with in this country is this belief that we have nothing of any worth within our waters all too often, you know, we, we go on holiday to the Mediterranean, the waters are crystal clear, we can see the wildlife down there. We have this belief that the Mediterranean waters are so much richer than our own. It's very much the other way around. It's just that our waters, and probably particularly in North Devon, where you've got the greater energy of the tides lifting the silt and making the waters more cloudy, um, our waters tend to be much more turbid but, on a, and they tend to be turbid, not because of the, the silt or, or, you know, dirt within the water, but because of the very amount of life living within it. Our waters are incredibly rich for plankton. And very often it's the plankton blooms that make our waters turbid more than dirt within the water. And on a good clear day, and I hope everybody has been out snor snorkeling and seen this, on a good day, you can see that how much richer our waters are than the likes of the Mediterranean. And we do have that colour. We do very much have that variety. We just need to find it on a good clear day. 
But going back to our estuaries, this is a very natural um, picture of an estuary. With all those diatoms on the surface of the mud, every time the tide comes in, it will pick up a proportion of that. And you will get these slicks of, you know, and they are quite smelly and they are quite dirty. You do get these slicks of diatoms, this, this, this crud coming up into our estuaries. And if you look carefully, you will often see things like grey mullet that come up with the tides and they are feeding on that. If anybody's ever eaten a grey mullet, they tend to taste very muddy and it's because they've been eating this stuff. But please keep your eyes open just because you know that estuaries can be full of that debris like that. Not all debris is natural. If you th see things like panty liners, toilet paper, other unmentionables flowing out, be wary that probably is a pollution event. And we can all keep our eye, eyes and ears open. <clears throat> and this is just the kind of thing that the Environment Art Agency are asking us to report. You will all, particularly during these COVID times, you will always have a blue light response, but they can build up a picture from these reports and they can realize when pollution uh, events are happening. And the thing to do is to ring that number 0800 80 70 60 whenever you see any of these things and they will hopefully um, be able to help in the long term the things that really gets them reacting are large numbers of dead fish which hopefully you don't tend to see it's my belief that you know the majority of marine conservation is about taking away whatever impact is uh, affecting the marine environment. On land, you know, if you want to rejuvenate a, a pond, we can get a, a bulldozer in to, to dig it deeper. If you want to work in a woodland, we can take axe and chainsaw, we can spray things. But within the marine environment, it's so much more difficult to put things right. And what we really have to do is to let the environment rewild itself, if you like. So the way of cons marine conservation is to take away the, the negative impacts and then let the marine environment rewild and look after itself. So within our estuaries management plan, uh, we work together within our local communities and within most of our estuaries, we have uh, a local community forum that is uh, we have used to hold twice a year, but now we're, we're having to do it online, which is ha actually having some positives. We're, we're getting some organizations that didn't used to attend, but it, they're finding it easier to do online. And we invite representatives of all the different local community groups to come together uh, report on things that they're doing to help the common good of the estuaries management plan, things that they're seeing, observations they're seeing, and try and discuss out how we can sort of put things right. We work together with a huge number of organisations, agencies and, and authorities. Obviously, you know, it's in all our interest to, to look our, after our estuaries. And these, you know, this is part of the estuary management plan. These are all things that are very interconnected that we're aware of, we're encouraging people to take action on. There's a, a little bit of a belief that, you know, the estuaries management plan is my job to do, but it's really what I'm turning around and saying to people, no, this is your estuary, estuaries management plan. This is up to all of us to, to make these actions. Some of the, um, a, a big common problem over most estuaries around the whole of UK is uh, nutrient enrichment, particularly of nitrates. And many, many of our estuaries, you get this green blanket weed that forms in the summer months. It's most obvious when the, the tide is out. And, you know, to some extent, uh, a certain amount of green seaweed is natural. But when it forms these big green algal mats over the mudflats in the summer, it just 
it inhibits the normal sort of mudflat ecology. You, it, you don't get the shrimps feeding on the mudflats. You don't get the birds feeding on those. And that huge amount of green algae can to build up and build up. Yes, it breaks down, but it brings that anoxic layer right to the surface. And it's uh, as an example of eutrophication. So we work together with the local community to raise awareness of this. You know, obviously a certain amount of nutrients is quite natural to flow in from the estuary. What we're really trying to do is to encourage people to minimize what they're adding to it and take it back to a magic uh, historic amount that we know that the estuaries could and should be able to cope with. And it's not just the, the nutrients that we all use, but the many garden chemicals that we use. So the biggest advice on that is to read the box and you use only the amount that it says on the tin. You know, it, there's that general idea that if one handful of fertilizer gives you two roses, then six handfuls must give you, what was it, 12 or something. You know, it doesn't work like that. Too much tends to, to run off and cause problems. Uh, a particularly problem, particular problem that we have within the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary are red tides. And these are, I don't know if you can see it very well. It, you, it's, it's easier to see in real life than it is to see on slides, but we get these great red tides, particularly in the summer months. And these are huge plankton blooms of dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are, are funny things. They, uh, I think they used to be in the animal kingdom and I think they're now considered as algae and they're now in the plant kingdom. These are organisms that can do a little bit of both. They can feed on other things, but they can also photosynthesize. So they're an oddity, but uh, they are also able to uh, synthesize some seriously, seriously nasty toxins. So if you eat shellfish that have themselves been bioaccumulating and feeding on these, dino, these dinoflagellates, you can get very, very seriously ill. So, you know, it's in all our interest to reduce these nutrients going in to try and reduce these, these harmful algal blooms. Um, we do think that within the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary, we're working with the University of Exeter on this, we do think part of the issue within the Salk and Kingsbridge estuary is the unique um, geography of the estuary. The fact that it's the, the tides pistoning, keeping a lot of the same waters within the estuary rather than a major river that's able to flash these nutrients out to sea. But, you know, hopefully working with the local community, we can reduce the amount of nutrients flowing in uh, and getting rid of some. But again, it's probably the nutrients coming in from the catchment rather than coming in from sea. We, you know, a lot of our estuaries management is and always has been working within the, the wider catchment of the estuary. Although the, the main priority has been working with those people that live on and around our, our estuary. So I went backwards there, didn't mean to do that. So we're working with the, the local community to, to raise awareness of how we can all have impacts. You know, estuary conservation actually starts at home. It starts with what we do when we don't put down the kitchen sink, because ultimately those nutrients, even though the, the wastewater waste um, treatment systems will hopefully break all that material down, those nutrients still flow out into our streams and rivers and ensuring that, you know, what we do put down there, we, we all need to go to the toilet, but we don't need to ram the remains of the, the Sunday lunch down the kitchen sink. It just adds to the problem. Um, and of course, it's all the other things that people may put down, uh, road drains, their own drains. <coughs> How often have we seen people that smoke drop the cigarette ends and actually the butts of those 
the, the, the filter within those are actually made of plastic, not paper. So not only will they not rot down, but they're also full of nasty chemicals that we all know about. So it's going back to this cumulative impact of the many, many small problems. It's not rocket science that what we really need to do is turn all of these things on its head. We all take small um, lifestyle changes. And if we all do it, we're going to have some really positive impacts. More recently, we've been extending more of our work into what we call the catchment based approach. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure there will, be, yes, there will be a catchment um, based approach partnership within North Devon. Uh, I, I don't know who they are, but we uh, are really here trying to work with the whole community within the catchment areas to make everyone aware about that thing of it all starting at home. And these are the, the people involved in that. One thing that came from that is that we produced this fantastic um, animation with this guy, Mr. Britton. Uh, this is really worth watching. It's called The Drip. It's available on, on YouTube. And the, here we are, The Drip. The URL of that, URL of that is available there. It's, it's only five minutes long. It's a bit of fun. If anybody has any way of making it go viral, please help. We want, really want everybody to see it. Um, quite a bit of my work these days is also looking at planning applications. Um, not all planning is bad. We, we all want to make uh, changes, but it's trying to encourage those changes that do happen to be as positive as possible. Uh, within our estuary, it's very difficult always to make like for like changes, but we tr do try and sit, insist on these days that if there is a change, that there is a positive gain for wildlife. And the kind of things that we have to concern ourselves about is the, the, the storage and transport of the materials for the build and the waste. You know, this, this is the damage to, done to the foreshore near Kingsbridge by that dumper truck, uh, bringing materials in, taking west, waste out, fires on the foreshore. You know, none of these are massively great. The environment will tend to look after itself again, but it comes back to this nibble, nibble, nibble around the edges. And it's not just the stuff that happens right on the water's edge, but very often we're, um, you know, developments within the catchment too. And we need developers to realize this and to consider the runoff from the build itself, the, the building materials, the chemicals. So in this example, you've got runoff from this building site going down a road train, road drain, and then out into the estuary. It's not always that difficult to um, sort out. You know, a few hay um, bales around here would tend to filter out some of that debris going down there. But ecologists too, you know, when uh, people are looking at, you know, what, what is the uh, impact of uh, development going to be? We've seen examples like this, where the ecologist has described the, the foreshore as just another mud flat. And, you know, and you can see in that photograph that it's anything but just the mud flat. They were more concerned about the bats and the, the, the birds within the, the, the land bit themselves. And talking of them, you know, we also need to concern ourselves right down to, to light spill of developments around the edge of the, our estuaries and our shores, because it's not just going to impact things like bats, but a lot of marine life time their reproduction around the action uh, of the, the cycle of the moon. And if you get light spill around the edge, it can just mess that whole timing mechanism up. So we're, we're working with our local universities to, to look at what we can to actually enhance the, the marine environment. This is one of the, the more positive things that we can do. Unfortunately, it doesn't always look that natural. That's one of our problems. We, we tend to work in patterns. 
Another growing issue is that of uh, invasive non-native species. Uh, these are all the kind of uh, non-natives that we're getting around our shores at the moment. And Paula earlier on mentioned the Pacific oysters that we have been doing something about. But on the whole, with most of these, it's more about the prevention of their occurrence rather than trying to do anything about them once they arrive. And things like the uh, American slip limpet. And once these things arrive, um, their very feeding actually tends to almost concrete the, the seedbed uh, together. And they, they are causing some local problems. Uh, carpets, sea squirts. Um, the, the, and this is as bad as it gets. I don't know if you've seen this. This is as bad as it gets with the uh, Pacific oysters. This is the Yelm estuary. That used to be an amenity beach, but now you just can't walk across there in anything but sort of heavy soled boots because you would cut your um, feet to ribbons walking across that. And people have had to put signs up there now, warning people about the dangers of the, these oysters. Um, and not just animals too, but plants. This is the uh, Spartina, common core grass. And this is actually one of the things that got me into marine conservation in the first place. When I finished university, this is actually a photograph of me spraying Spartina on the Eden Estuary up in Scotland in probably 1985. Yeah, note to take the, the dog out afterwards. Okay. Um, you will have heard about the Pacific Oyster uh, project that we've been involved in. Um, and here, we, what we've been trying to do is to control where we can the populations of Pacific oyster around our shores. You know, places like the Yelm, we, we, at the moment, we don't have the understanding or the technology to be able to do anything about that. But places like Solcombe, we can. So this is the, the Pacific oyster on the left and our own common native oyster on the right. This is what we would like to see more of. They, uh, if we get great enough numbers of these, they will actually help filter the water and keep our estuaries cleaner. But they tend to live deeper down in the, the seabed of our estuaries. The Pacific oysters tend to live around their shores. And that's a photograph of uh, a, a more native oyster-like habitat. Pacific oysters came in because of overfishing and the likes of our own native oysters. What we mustn't do is blame all the, the fish farmers that did this. They were very much encouraged to do this. But at the time that they were brought in, we had this belief that our waters were too cold for Pacific oysters to breed. Uh, but life, as they say in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. And we certainly have them breeding on our shores now. So we've been working with local volunteers to uh, map them and bash them. And, you know, places like Solcombe, we certainly are making a difference. I mentioned the Yelm. These, these red areas are where we've already got these reefs that at the moment we can't do anything about. Um, places like Dartmouth, where they're growing on the seawalls, they're actually Got to, we've got to find a, a method of being able to control them there. We can bash them off easily, but they might just collect at the bottom and cause other problems. And then places like Solcombe, yes, I think we can, uh, we can stay on top of them if we continue to get this great support of our local volunteers. But, you know, this specific oyster project has brought in a, a few positives. We've discovered a brand new um, common seagrass bed within the Solcombe estuary. We may have discovered a new seagrass bed in, within the Erm estuary. These are um, plants that we found washed up around the Erm estuary, so there may well be a bed just out there. And it's proven to me that I need to get out more. Um, this is a, a view of the dwarf seagrass beds of the Solcombe Kingsbridge estuary. I knew that we had them there, 
but I just hadn't realized just how extensive they were. But one of, it also shows up, you know, getting out more shows up the problems. The, this is the, the blanket green algae growing out over the, the seagrass. If we are able to control the, the blankets more, we might actually get more seagrass growing and they would help mop up this, the, the nutrients in a positive way. So if we can make a step change, we, like I said before, we might be able to get the environment to help look after itself. We've got to get it over that tipping point. One thing we have discovered within the um, dwarf seagrass beds, if you, you can see them here, you know, is numbers of Pacific oysters building up there. Now, normally we call these Pacific oysters rock oysters because um, they, they like to attach to rocks. But here, what we think they're doing is settling out onto the shell of cockles. And in places, they are actually starting to form beds. Um, we, we have some problems here. Now, our biggest problem is actually getting to the site to do anything about it. Now, this is quite a remote site and we haven't got permission to cross the land of the neighboring uh, owners there. But what we may need to do here is to walk out over the mudflats with uh, long lengths of pipe and physically push the oysters down into the mud to bury them, uh, which is a bit controversial, but the logistics of physically removing the oysters off site could actually do an awful lot of damage in its own right. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, so right, bringing it right up to date then, we've got the, the COVID uh, impact during lockdown one, uh, those of us that were able to continue a little bit visiting our shores just realised just how much wildlife was taking advantage of these quieter times. And we saw seals hauled out where we'd never seen them before. But then, of course, after lockdown, we had more people visiting our estuaries out on paddle boards, out on canoes and everything else. And the disturbance factor went through the roof. And now we're looking at the possible necessity of producing not just an update in the countryside code, but forming a new coastal code as well, just to encourage people to realise what impact they're having. And if you all want to go to the coast to enjoy this wildlife, how best to behave, to enjoy it, conserve it and see it. And then, of course, there are things that are still come to pass, you know. This is a, a new electric motor that you can now bolt onto the bottom of your paddleboard, which was, you know, uh, and also things like paddleboards are now becoming increasingly, I won't say cheap, but affordable to us. Um, so, you know, places that were once remote and quiet are now becoming more busy and we may need to, to zone some of these places, which will be quite controversial in its own right. And of course, we tend to want to do these things faster and faster. Um, you know, and we tend to think about, you know, electric cars can do no wrong. You know, an electric surfboard, yeah, maybe no problem. But when you start getting things like electric jet skis, you know, they will come with new levels of responsibility. Uh, you know, they may be quiet. Uh, we may not hate them as much but suddenly you can start sneaking up on cetaceans and things that will have its own level of disturbance. So, sorry, that's been a bit of a, a whistle top store. There's, with some of these things, there's no nice logical uh, feed through the, the, the system, but uh, I, I hope that's been enjoyable for you. Uh, I'll stop there and I will gladly take any questions. <laughs>